Hi, everyone. Welcome to What the F is Going On in Latin America. This is Code Pink's weekly webinar, 20 Minutes of Hot News out of Latin America and the Caribbean. We broadcast every Wednesday, 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 p.m. Eastern, on Code Pink's YouTube channel. Today, in the aftermath of the police killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis, we are honored to be in conversation with Ajamu Baraka about the systemic changes needed within the U.S and outside the US regarding US militarization of both domestic and foreign policy. But first I wanna introduce our guest to you. Ajamu Baraka is the national organizer for Black Alliance for Peace. He's the member of the leadership for UNAC, United National Anti-War Coalition, and he is on the executive committee of the US Peace Council. And I should also fully disclose I voted for you for vice president. <laughs> And I remember having a great conversation with you about that um, at an airport in Latin America. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, when I had the, we had the pleasure of it meeting you quite by coincidence. It was a wonderful afternoon to have a conversation with you. Um, well, so, well, thank Adam, you so much, Terry. It's really a pleasure to be with you. Well, I'm so happy you, you accepted the invitation. It's a real honor um, to be in conversation with you today. And, I know all of us um, on the Code Pink Latin America team really um, value your work and um, the, the legacy of your, your resume and life that you bring to this work. And so you have so much experience to share with us and a, and a, and a great personal history to bring to this moment we're living in in the United States right now. And I wonder um, if perhaps we could just start with. Um, what we're seeing, what this spontaneous combustion has been, or what a lot of people in the U.S. are seeing as a spontaneous combustion in, um, as a result of George Floyd's murder by the Minneapolis police. Well, you know, uh, Terry, it is a very, very interesting uh, moment. Um, and it's always important when you see resistance and the spontaneous, as you referred to it, uh, reaction to the killing of George uh, Floyd uh, was something that, you know, really can't just be understood by looking at the case of George Floyd. I think it was a, I think it was a trigger, uh, Terry. I think that there was a lot of frustration, a lot of anger um, in the populace. I think a lot of people were feeling that uh, the value of their lives were not really uh, recognized. Uh, and so with this, this, this gruesome uh, image of the police authorities uh, uh, killing this, this, this human being, uh, it, sparked, it sparked a reaction. And so the claim and the call was for, for justice for uh, George Floyd. Uh, but in a way, I kind of see it almost as a metaphor because it was really a call for justice uh, for the people. It was a, um, a, a reaction to, to the, the systemic unfairness that people were seeing, the, the, the assault on the dignity of people when um, it, it was quite clear that the authorities were more concerned with saving the economy than saving lives and driving people back, uh, back to work. Uh, it was, uh, the memory of all that we have seen the U.S. involved in and degrading uh, people around the world from sanctions against Venezuela to uh, invading directly countries uh, like uh, uh, Afghanistan and Iraq. So it, it almost was a culmination of all of these issues uh, that took people into the streets. And this, that basis that I think has sustained the energy as, as the unarticulated uh, uh, concerns and angers, uh, you know, are now slowly pivoting to a articulation mm. of opposition to the system itself. Well, what we're seeing in some ways, uh, Terry, is um, a US specific kind of uh, expression very similar to what we saw unfold in France uh, with yes. the yellow vest. 
Yeah. That the 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 spark was a pinch of reform, but then it it began to quickly pivot to um, uh, an assessment and a a condemnation of the neoliberal order itself. You know, the people in France have been so. When you watch journalists just interview pretty much anybody protesting on the streets, every one of them is so articulate about the system they're protesting. I mean, they understand the privatization of central banks and they have a very, very sophisticated uh, you know, um, understanding of, of what they're living within and why they can't succeed, so to speak. You know, there's a couple things that um, you, you mentioned, um, the, the unveiling of failures, of our of this system in the United States, um, systemic unfairness. Do you you know it's been it's been interesting to watch what this um, um, unveiled. I think to a lot of people, particularly younger people here in the United States, that this massive push to privatization is massive. Um, support for neoliberal capitalism has denied so many people, good working people of all ages, of all racial demographics, economic and educational demographics. It's denied so many people access to health care, to, um, to sub, you know, s substantive housing with you know, clean, the, base, the basic necessities you need to fight this pandemic, clean water for God's sakes in many communities isn't available. Do you think that the pandemic has, has helped unveil this failure of the system to a much broader demographic in this country? I think so, Terry. I think that this is precisely what I'm referring to, that the, you know, you can't really understand the cry for justice for George Floyd without in fact connecting that to what everyone was seeing happening around, around the country uh, with, as a consequence of the pandemic. The, um, the inability or reluctance of the authorities and ruling class uh, to really look out for the, for, for the objective human rights and human needs of the population. Everyone, I think, felt uh, felt the, 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 the consequence of being seen as, in essence, a, a cog uh, in something that was beyond them that they really completely didn't understand. Uh, so I think that what we have with this uprising is a recognition, a, a, a development recognition, a radicalization, if you will, of the general population. And in particular, among um, these young folks, you know, people are trying to understand why you had such a, a outpouring of solidarity and support uh, among young folks and among young white folks. And I think part of it was that, uh, that the cultural shift that's taking place uh, where people are, are understanding the, the, the full complexities uh, and deep uh, character of, of white supremacy, uh, but also a, an understanding that white supremacy just cannot be reduced just to the attitudes in people's heads, but mm -hmm. that there in fact is a systemic element to this. And so that, that understanding um, you know, of white supremacy and connecting that to the contradictions of capitalism uh, is, is I think what's helping to sustain the energy and helping to make this pivot uh, away from just a focus on one individual to uh, back to the system, back to the, the structures of, of relations. Um, and that process is, is a process that is very, very scary to the authorities because mm. as I said in one of my pieces, the, the, the nightmare situation for the authorities is to see the emergence of a multinational and multiracial opposition under the leadership of African Americans. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they are doing everything that they can do now to break up that possibility, to, to break up that, that developing coalition, uh, including trying to keep the focus just on the issue of race. And that's why they brought in, you know, a Reverend Sharpton and, 
and, and they're trying to bring in other elements to try to put them on top of something that they really didn't have any real connection to. So, you know, this is a very interesting time. And, and Terry, for us, you know, coming out of our community, understanding the, the, the international uh, connections between the state uh, and oppression domestically and, 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 and militarized policing uh, domestically uh, and the militarization uh, and warmongering uh, taking place by the U.S. authorities globally, you know, we have to help those connections be made. And you exactly. can talk about, for example, defunding the police uh, in the U.S. and that talk about uh, defunding the military apparatus, uh, divesting from uh, militarism. So these connections have to be made, and I think they're being made. I think that, um, you know, I heard a, well, gosh, there's a couple of things you said that I'd like us to follow up on. This, this movement we're seeing today, and it is, it is, you know, at least the rallies and protests I've gone to, it's been principally younger people, young, people younger than me, I will say, uh, but they have embraced my presence. Um, it being multi-generational, multi-ethnic, multi, you know, all a real cross section of demographics in the country, which historically the state has really, I believe has used racism, you know, to keep people divided. And I have, a lot of us have always said, you know, once white working class people figure out that they're suffering the same failures of the state as people of color, there's going to be a problem when that all comes together as one big melting pot of understanding. And I think that's exactly what we're seeing now and why the, the militarized response is so strong. And you've got the military sol trying to solve these problems that are more uh, economic and humanitarian, and they don't necessarily, they cannot be solved just by uh, beating people down. And I think a lot of pe younger people really, um, they understand that. And I think many of us that have been activists for years clearly understand there's historically always been funding for the police and the military at the detriment of funding um, public infrastructure and institutions. And more and more people in this moment have are clearly seeing that because they're suffering the failure of having access to public institutions right now. And it's the same thing that I would argue we saw um, last year in the um, uprisings in Haiti, and then, and then soon to follow in Ecuador, and then immediately on the heels of Ecuador in Chile. Chile, of course, being the first neoliberal experiment in, in the Americas, and it came, you know, it's on the verge of completely crashing down with the dissatisfaction of the population there. I think we're seeing very similar. Here we say riot, the outside world is saying uprising. And maybe we can talk a little bit about that. Well, I think that uh, I think you're absolutely right, um, Terry. And what, what is happening in terms of, of the shift in consciousness, this development in consciousness, uh, is that I think probably even more so among young people than others, that people are understanding the full complexities of, of white supremacy. You know, understanding that it has a uh, a material basis also. Uh, and, and that's what we try to do in the work that we involved in the Black Alliance for Peace, that we are helping to develop that kind of awareness that if one is concerned about, about white supremacy, that you have to also be concerned about its basis, its, its continuity. And this continuity is a consequence of, of its materiality, that uh, white supremacy you know, has to be grounded within the context of ongoing, the ongoing colonial uh, capitalist system. That uh, if there's good, that, that white supremacy will manifest itself in a particular way domestically, but you have to understand how that's being manifested internationally. Exactly. That you, can't, you can't allow the authorities to pretend that they care about black lives uh, in the U.S. Uh, while, while, while they're systematically uh, perpetuating the uh, colonial uh, exploitation and oppression of Palestinians. You can't you know, talk about uh, militarism and, and, and violence uh, in the US uh, and not say anything about uh, the violence 
uh, and, and war being unleashed uh, on, on Yemen. You know, we've got to make those contradictions I mean, clear to folks. You can't talk about you concerned about uh, gun violence, uh, but yet you don't uh, say a mumbling word uh, about the expanding military budget. So, you know, people understanding that, that this, this is a real material basis for perpetuating a white minority power. And that's what we're talking about. We're talking about a, a white minority. When we're talking about the, the capitalist class. You know, we say very clearly, we live in a, in a, a dictatorship, a capitalist dictatorship. And at the core of this dictatorship is the ability of, of this ruling class to utilize the repressive apparatuses of the state, both domestically and using the military internationally. Uh, and that, that materiality, that use of the state, is also manifested in other uh, structures of white supremacy that we say we've, we've got to oppose. For example, NATO. Mm. We see NATO as a white supremacist structure. So you can have Democrats who are uh, saying they oppose to, to Trump while they are while simultaneously are suggesting that they, uh, Trump's hand should be tied uh, to uh, prevent him from making any kind of changes in the U.S.-NATO relationship. It's a contradiction. But well, we don't even get involved in that, Terry. We say basically NATO is a white supremacist structure that needs to be uh, dismantled. Okay. Same thing with the uh, uh, IMF, the uh, International Monetary Fund, the World Bank. Uh, we see these as uh, institutional expressions of white supremacy, the 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 uh, hegemony of the dollar. You know, as long as you have the yeah. dollar, you're going to have the the, the hegemony of, of the U.S. and U.S. finance uh, capital. So, you know, we see these structures as the, the targets of white supremacy. You can't, you're not gonna do away with white supremacist ideology just look at, looking at and in, involved, involved in all these torturous conversations with white folks and other people <laughs> about how to get rid of uh, white supremacy. We're not interested in that. In fact, personally, I don't even consider myself an anti-racist. I don't care what white folks think about me. I'm concerned about white supremacist ideology and the structural relations that sustain it, okay? Give us some power and we'll deal and we'll deal with white supremacy. You know, the issue is the issues of power uh, and oppression. And when you have uh, oppressed people who are uh, informed and driven by a new ethical framework, the one to see all of us as, as, as equal human beings who are opposed to any kind of hierarchy in terms of, of, of power, uh, you know, then we are on our way to building a new world and ridding ourselves of, of, of domination from any source. Wow, okay, so we're, so we're looking at, you know, complete systemic change and the tearing down of these institutions and organizations across the planet. And I agree with you, they are, they are institutions and systems that are used and by the United States and or controlled um, to basically, and I, and I think, you know, the AFRICOM, uh, expansion of AFRICOM, which very few US citizens even understand, ex you know, know exists, you know, is basically neo-colonialism neo in, the, in the sense that many of us studied, you know, in high school very similar to the structure of the globe prior to World War I. In my mind, I see it that way very much. Look, look, you're absolutely right, Terry. And that's why the work of Cole Pink has been so incredibly important in terms of helping to bring attention to the, 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 the outrageous reality of the U.S. in essence dividing up the world in these military uh, command structures. Uh, because the U.S. projects its, will project or projects its power globally, and you know the very fact that we have uh, 800 to 1,000 bases, these that we know about, that we know about, <laughs> that, we know that, about we know about. <laughs> that are in support of these global command structures it is really outrageous. So, Africom, the U.S. Africa Command, is one of those structures, and the Black Alliance of Peace. We developed a campaign. Uh, to focus on AFRICOM that uh, emerged out of the, uh, the coalition to close all, U all U.S. foreign bases. Uh, 
we were working with that coalition, but then we, we narrowed down to with a special emphasis on Africa. And we thought that was important, Terry, because again, making those connections between you know, U.S. Uh, global militarism uh, and war migrant and domestic. So we say, you know, we are opposed to AFRICOM uh, and the deepening uh, military footprint on the African continent. Uh, but we also opposed to the uh, Department of Defense 1033 program that's been responsible for militarizing police forces across the country. So you have to make those connections. So yes, AFRICOM is something we are now focusing in on. We have a big program June 16th. Um, uh, June 16th is the uh, anniversary of what, what we refer to as Soweto Day. Uh, this mm. was the day in 1976 uh, where the youth of South Africa uh, really intensified the anti-apartheid struggle in that country when it rose up uh, across the country uh, in South Africa. And many people pointed to that, that day and that period uh, as really the beginning of the end to the apartheid system. We're saying on June 16th, uh, we're going to rise up uh, to shut down uh, Africa, the U.S. Africa Command. So look out for information on that webinar. Yeah, I was going to say, make sure you send us that uh, the, the details for that, because uh, we'll be more than supportive in that effort. Um, you are talking to me from um, Colombia this morning, and we've been talking about yes. um, the U.S. militarization pretty much of the planet, specifically uh, the global south. And so living in Colombia, you know, you're, you're, you're living among seven or eight, I think possibly nine now U.S. military bases and or Navy bases. And somehow we still keep um, seeing narcotics come out of Colombia. <laughs> we, we see um, many, I, I would argue a lot of, particularly the paramilitary activity that um, is witnessed in, in Colombia and, and, the, and the oppression that it's used for. We're, we saw very much here on the streets in DC last Wednesday, particularly these units on the street that were black uniforms, riot squads with no um, label as to which um, institution they were representing. And, you know, for me, that was, very, very reminiscent of Honduras, Colombia, all these various paramilitary um, U.S. back dictatorships, U.S. back governments throughout um, the Americas. I wonder, you know, so again, we're seeing the U.S. military in this hemisphere being used principally in Latin America and the Caribbean. Again, which is predominantly people of color, uh, people of a African descendants, uh, and Latino, Hispanic, principally people of color, again, being oppressed by this huge presence of the US military. And it's very prevalent throughout the global South, which is primarily non white people. And I think that that really just physically illustrates so much of your prior comments about how it how these institutions just completely promote and um, and attempt to ensure the you know progression of white supremacy in all its forms now that was a very well, you, commentary i apologize <laughs> no 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 but you're, you're absolutely right jerry and you know that's why it's so this program is so important too to keep the focus on on our Americas, because this is key to U.S. to U.S. hegemony. They are attempting to try to uh, to maintain their hegemony in this region, and that's primarily too why uh, the focus was so intensely uh, uh, moved uh, on on Venezuela. But I'll come back to that in a second. What we have in the U.S. I mean, in in in, in the Americas, uh, is an intensification of militarism. Uh, and we see it, of course, here in Colombia, uh, with the uh, access given to uh, to, U to U.S. Uh, forces by the Colombian government, um, and we are very much concerned, and so are people in, in this country are concerned about the recent announcement of the deployment 
of a, of a brigade of military, U.S. military personnel into the country, uh, theoretically to be involved in uh, anti-narcotic activity, uh, but everybody knows that they are being deployed up to the uh, Venezuelan border as part of the efforts to, uh, to bring about so-called regime change in Venezuela. Um, we're also concerned about, uh, when we talk about our region, uh, that region also includes the Caribbean, the, uh, Caribbean yeah. and the militarization of the, of the Caribbean uh, uh, region. Uh, and the attempt, again, by the U.S. to isolate uh, Venezuela and to isolate also uh, Cuba. Uh, and we've seen this intensification uh, of, of, a, of a naval presence uh, in the Caribbean Sea and off the coast of, of Venezuela. So militarism, you know, has, is, is really intensifying in this region. Um, and again, when we talk about, you know, uh, structures like NATO, uh, that is supposed to be the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, you have to wonder, or really they expose uh, the fact that there's nothing but a white supremacist structure when NATO is expanding into Latin America. What does Latin America have to do with the North Atlantic? Well, because the, North, the, the NATO is a, uh, a, a white supremacist military arm uh, of, of the what we call the the uh, axis of domination, the U.S., EU, NATO axis of domination. So Let me just take a minute to explain to our viewers when you've mentioned North Atlantic Treaty Association and then it's expanding into Latin America, just so that our viewers understand, Colombia, I believe now, is a NATO global partner. Is that the label that they've, they function under NATO now? Yeah, a global partner of NATO. You know, exactly. with a Caribbean with a Caribbean coast. <laughs> so. Yeah, no, it is, it, and that's what I'm referring to. That basically, you have this 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 this, this association, this relationship. This they are a global partner, and they are um, effecting the same kind of relationship with Brazil. So here you have the U.S. again pretending to be committed to democracy and human rights uh, domestically. Pretending to concern, be concerned with, with uh, non-European life, uh, but yet they are actively supporting right-wing uh, 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 governments in Latin America. So they will point us toward the so-called neo-fascism of Donald Trump uh, in the U.S., uh, but then there's bipartisan support for neo-fascism in various countries in Latin America. Exactly. It, yeah. it, it it's crazy. Shows you the, the, it's crazy, and then the, the, the contempt they have for the intelligence of people in the U.S. Yeah. Well, you know, I was sharing with you before um, we started broadcasting that here in D.C., uh, uh, in my neighborhood, um, I live among many um, Central American migrants, and they have, rightfully so, many live in fear of, of ICE raids. But since George Floyd's murder, I've had many conversations with people really now uh, uh, from Central America, really now understanding and seeing, I think, this whole, that this militarization, these horrible death squads and military finance regimes that many of them fled from in the 80s, they are now seeing actually exist here on the streets in the United States. I mean, the, the ICE raids and the ICE arrests, they really kept compartmentalized, unfortunately, to their own specific uh, migration and living circumstances. But to see this broader nationwide militarization of the streets and how and how it's used to oppress all citizens is very reminiscent to them of the countries, <laughs> the U.S. backed countries they fled. Honduras today, but Salvador, Guatemala, uh, in the in the eighties, and it, it's really, um, it's been fascinating for me to have these conversations. But I think it's also really, really important that so many demographics here in the states are opening up and seeing what's actually happening. Exactly. Um, and, and not only are they are understanding um, by their presence in the U.S., 
but we are seeing that the that the entire world is seeing uh, the 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 realities of the U.S. that have been effectively sort of um, uh, masked for quite some time. Mm -hmm. uh, in particular, during the eight years of of of, 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 uh, of Barack Obama, um, and it is it, it, you know we were talking before we started that you know we've been around long enough to to remember the upsurge of resistance in the 1960s and 70s and, and the, the, the international understanding uh, that people had about the nature of the system. Uh, but you know, that, the nature of the system has been somewhat obscured ever since. Uh, but now a new generation, a new generations, if you will, of people uh, are somewhat surprised by what they have uh, seen. Well, the, the images, people don't understand, especially when you're outside of the U.S., the kind of images that are circulating from yeah. the police actions across the country. I mean, because, you know, if you're just watching the U.S. media, you're seeing some, but you're not seeing what we're seeing. Right. Yeah. And the, the images uh, from across the country of brutality uh, has been quite shocking to many people. Uh, and so, yeah, people inside the U.S., but even more importantly, uh, people outside of the U.S. Uh, are, are seeing the, the true uh, nature of these bipartisan forces uh, who are in charge in the U.S. And that's why they are making the connections even more quicker than sometimes we are in the U.S. You mentioned earlier about when you hear, see an interview with a uh, French citizen, how uh, crystal clear they are about uh, global uh, uh, realities. Um, you know, we have not got to that point yet in the U.S., uh, but we're getting there. That basically people are starting to understand what they're up against. Uh, and people outside the U.S., they already got it. And so they're already making the, the transition from uh, George Floyd to, to the police, uh, to the state, uh, to the system. And that's why they are, are, are really, uh, 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 they really uh, ex express appreciation for this budding resistance movement in the U.S. because they know that if there's an effective people-centered uh, human rights movement in the U.S. that can put a break on U.S. Uh, 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 backward retrograde policies, that they will benefit from that because they are the ones that find themselves in the crosshairs of U.S. subversion uh, and military intervention, uh, warmongering, uh, and the only way that's going to stop, and they know this, is when the people in the U.S. Uh, put a break on it. And that's you know, for them is really, really important. So would you say there, there's uh, a lot of hopefulness in the, in the international community right now about what, I mean, it, it's tragedy, but in that tragedy is opportunity for change. You see hopefulness in the international community. I ask you this because the 40 years that I've been in and out of Latin America, and specifically the years where I've um, organized delegations to various parts of Central and South America and the Caribbean, invariably on every trip, and I'm sure that you probably hear, hear this too, every trip you will in, inevitably hear from someone, whether it's in a formal meeting, on the street, in a restaurant, someone will say, Go home and fix your own country first. The rest of us will benefit. Do you see this as perhaps an opportunity to fix our own country first now? Well, I see it as an opportunity to strengthen solidarity. Mm. That, that there's no fix here or there in, in, in that, that, that kind of chronology. I, I think I understand the spirit of what they're saying. That basically we have, we have a responsibility as citizens of empire to put a break on, on the U.S. state, and that's important. So that, that, that is a, a, a criticism or a critique that we, we fully embrace. Uh, that is our, our responsibility. Uh, but at the same time, though, we are in solidarity with people who are struggling around the world. So we're not going to, you know, to be confused by that. So we, 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 we stand with and those of us like yourself, uh, you know, who are standing with the people of Latin America they have to understand that you are there because you are building opposition to U.S. policies uh, back in, in the U.S. And it's important for people from the U.S. to see firsthand yeah. uh, the conditions uh, and the consequences of U.S. policy. So yeah, we, 
we, we definitely have to do that. that people are, are hopeful because, again, they understand that it's only going to be a, a popular resistance that would change U.S. policies. Uh, and, but they are concerned, like I am, uh, with the moves we've seen being made these last few days to, to domesticate uh, the opposition, to, uh, to keep it at a, uh, a manageable level uh, with the focus just being on uh, so-called uh, uh, justice for George Floyd. What does that mean? George Floyd is dead. You know, there's, no, there's no justice for him, but what we can do is to put a, 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 a critical uh, view on the system that created the conditions that resulted in George Floyd's uh, life being taken. Uh, and when you put this, the, the focus on the system, then you connect George Floyd to the police. You connect George Floyd to the military. Uh, you can connect George Floyd uh, to the system. And that is what people are hoping is, is, it happens. But the authorities are using uh, the, the Congressional Black Caucus and, mm -hmm. and, and what we call Reverend Chicken Wings Sharpton. You know, they are doing everything in their power to subvert uh, a, a radicalization of this movement. Uh, and uh, we are hoping that they're not going to be successful in that because, uh, you know, the world will benefit when there is an effective people-centered movement in the U.S. and we're able to shift power away from these, these gangsters uh, back to the people. Well, and shifting power from the gangsters back to the people we hear, we, and we have heard this since at least since 1980 with Ronald Reagan, that government is, is not the solution, it's the problem and, and the reduction of taxes and basically reducing taxes to financially starve off public institutions and infrastructure. And so here we are now in the States with no public access for, for the things that average citizens need. And I'm hopeful that those connections that you're talking about are, they seem to be being made, particularly by younger people. And I'm, I'm very hopeful for that because I'm with you, the change has got to happen here in order to um, help us influence change abroad. All the money that we need to improve the life of, of the vast majority of US citizens is in our police and military budgets. It's all there, we don't have to raise taxes for those people who are afraid of raising taxes. We don't have to. The money is all there. It just needs to be, um, you know, reappropriated in a good accounting term. It's, it's, very, it's actually a very simple issue. The money is all there. And so you have a lot yes. of people calling to defund the, defund, defund the police, but we at Code Pink would also, you know, call for defunding the Pentagon as well. And uh, it would help those of us at home and abroad, you know, to do both. The other thing I, I agree with you is making sure that this movement, this uprising, as so many international people are seeing it, is not co-opted. And I have to say, I was really startled, almost horrified to see Nancy Pelosi taking a knee. I think yesterday was the photograph I saw. I was like, no, 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 no. That, that's not, I mean, that's not what this is about and hopefully does not become about that. And of course, people feeling that change can be made in the fall at the, at the ballot box by voting for Joe Biden is most certainly not the solution. I mean, Joe Biden voted for many of the policies that are, have resulted in this behavior we're seeing today. And of course, he supported the war in Iraq, and in the Obama administration started seven wars overseas. So I don't, you know, so that's more perpetuation of this racist um, foreign infrastructure that you've been talking about. He's not the solution, unfortunately, in my mind. Well, you know, Terry, you, 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 that, the, the images we saw yesterday was, were, were uh, 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 insulting. Um, to see these uh, uh, Democrats uh, decked out in their kente cloth, yeah. um, taking a knee. I mean, it was it was the very fact that he thought that that, that, that kind of gratuitous stunt uh, would go over with uh, black folks. You know, is just uh, I think a reflection of the kind of contempt 
they have uh, for, for all of us, but in particular for the black community. And they, they were roundly uh, ridiculed uh, and, 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 you know, because of that, 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 that image. Uh, but again, these are examples of them attempting to try to uh, co-op this energy. And today they are uh, going through the spectacle of this phony um, uh, uh, bill uh, that the, uh, the Clinton News Network or CNN uh, refers to <laughs> as uh, uh, sweeping legislation on police on policing. There's nothing sweeping about that legislation. Policing is primarily a local function. Uh, some of the, the, the tippet, uh, uh, you know, uh, BS reforms are things that I really won't never see the light of day. Even if they did, they would, wouldn't make any real uh, significant uh, change. Uh, there is some language there about uh, putting certain uh, uh, restrictions on the uh, on the transfer of military weapons to the to the police. Uh, and I find it, we find it interesting that that, that stuff would be in there and the Congressional Black Caucus being the primary uh, driver of this. When it was the Congressional Black Caucus that uh, refused to oppose the, the 1033 program. Um, and, you know, and, and now they're pretending like now they want to uh, to oppose that. Well, let's see. Maybe they, maybe they might. If, that, if they do, that would be a good thing. But, you know, Again, we're not going to be uh, confused by these efforts on the part of the authorities to try to uh, domesticate uh, and depoliticize the uh, oppositional energy developing uh, from the street. They, they are feeling now, Terry, uh, the street heat, and they are scared to death. And that's a good thing. That's just, you know, one we thing don't want them to succeed Terry, in them. Yes. One thing that's happened in the, in, in the last couple of minutes I have with you, one thing that has happened is that people are starting to see the power of the people. When they see the kind of concessions that are being made by the authorities, uh, when they realize that uh, no, Donald Trump didn't go down to the bunker to inspect it, they were concerned about being overrun. And so they had to take Donald Trump down to the bunker to protect him from the people. When people see the, 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 the impact that they have had from their activity, uh, you can't put that genie back in the bottle. And so, you know, they're desperate to try to control it. Uh, and, you know, we'll see what happens. But uh, in the context of the ongoing and deep contradictions of, of this system, the fact that uh, there will be no economic recovery in a real way, that right. the millions of jobs that have been lost are not coming back, uh, where young people are not seeing any kind of future for themselves, uh, where people are now seeing that even within the context of the Democratic Party, uh, that you can't really make reforms because you have a corrupt uh, element that is, is, is more concerned with uh, maintaining control of that party than defeating a Donald Trump. Uh, all of these things are coming together, uh, Terry. Uh, and, you know, we're in a situation that is, that uh, what, what is going to unfold just in the next few months uh, could in fact be, uh, be revolutionary. It's actually very exciting to see the possibility and the energy. Uh, Jay, you know, for, 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 for those of us old heads uh, who've been through the 60s, and I'm so glad that I'm still here because this is, yeah, it's very, very exciting, and I'm glad to watch, be a part of this. Not just watch it, but be a part of historic change. It's, it's full of possibility, and I, I, I feel the same way you do. Listen, I know um, I promised you, you promised me 30 minutes, and we're going on about 50. So is there anything that, um, that you'd like to say in closing our conversation before I let you go back to your, your work? Only that I, I salute uh, Cole Pink uh, for, for being in the forefront of opposition, uh, for consistently putting themselves on the line, uh, for educating uh, the public in the ways that you all have done for, for, for many years. Uh, and that, you know, everybody should recognize uh, the moment that we're in uh, and that uh, 
trying to build and maintain unity among ourselves is vitally important. Uh, and that uh, we are on the, the, the edge of something really unique. And so I just urge everybody to keep the faith, uh, keep struggling, uh, let's move toward uh, uh, elevating the issues of war and militarism within the context of this electoral uh, season. Um, and know that uh, we're on the right side of history, even though things may get worse before they get better. Uh, we are on the right side of history. And in the end, Terry, uh, we're going to win. We are. So listen, everybody viewing today, I want you uh, to just thank Ajam Baraka for this very fascinating, um, in-depth conversation. I'm so grateful for your time, Ajamu. And um, all of you can, can uh, find his, his recent article is posted at blackallianceforpeace.org or at Black Agenda yeah, you Report. Could, uh, or both. Yeah, black, black Agenda Report dot, uh, dot com. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, and, but go to Black Agenda, go to blackalliancefor.peace.com to see our statements. Uh, because yes. the framing that we've been putting out, I think is a framing that uh, people need to be aware of and to use. So blackallianceforpeace.com, not .org. I think I got it, got it wrong. Exactly. And uh, also please visit uh, Divest from the War Machine. That's Code Pink's project, uh, codepink.org and divesting uh, from the war machine here at home and abroad. We'll also ask all of you to tune in next week uh, for what the F is going on in Latin America every Wednesday, 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 p.m. Eastern on Code Pink's YouTube channel. And also, please be sure to uh, listen to Code Pink Radio every Thursday, 11 a.m. Eastern on WBAI out of New York, simulcasting from WPFW in Washington, D.C. So thanks again, Ajamu. So appreciate your time this morning and really great to talk with you. Always an honor. My pleasure. Let's, let's do it again soon. Yes, I look forward to it. Thanks so much. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. All right, Terry. Take Thanks it easy. Thanks so much. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay.